Hello, I'm Tim Weaving, a PhD student at University College London, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 17th instalment in Comp Biomed's e-seminar series in collaboration with the uh, Virtual Physiological Human Institute, or VPHI. The talk today will be given by Adria Perez, a research fellow at Computational Science Group, GRIB, at Universitat Pompeu Fabra, or UPF. He holds a biochemistry degree from Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona and a master's degree in bioinformatics from UPF. The Computational Science Research Group, led by Gianni de Fabritis, is dedicated to computational science in biomedicine and machine learning. The group's research interests are rooted in applications of computation to solve real-world problems. Specifically, they develop new methods and algorithms and apply them to computational chemistry, drug design, protein folding, with many other applications as well. The group and the spin-off company Acelera, founded in 2006, has collaborated with major industries worldwide, such as Sony, NVIDIA, HTC Mobile, UCB and Pfizer, to name a few. The title of Adria's talk is Machine Learning Coarse-Grained Models with Graph Neural Networks, in which we will learn how to prepare, train and simulate coarse-grained models with graph neural networks using TorchMD, a deep learning framework for molecular simulations, and I believe Adria will also give us a live demonstration. Now, before we begin, I'd like to briefly remind you that the session is being recorded and will be available on the Comp Biomed website and YouTube channel shortly. So please do use this to go back over parts of today's talk and others in the series, and maybe even share these e-seminars with your friends and colleagues. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the talk, so please save your questions until, uh, until then. Once the talk is finished, you can post your questions in the questions tab, and I will read them out to Adria to keep the session running smoothly. Now that's everything from me. I very much hope that you all enjoyed today's talk. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Adria. OK, uh, thank you, Tim, for this uh, lovely presentation. Um, well, uh, I'm Adria Perez, uh, Perez and I'm going to show, uh, show you how to um, uh, train uh, coarse-grained uh, potential using graph neural networks and also later how to simulate it um with uh, our software torchmd um all right so let's start uh first of all um i wanted to try uh, to give an introduction on why we're doing all these simulations right and uh, i have this great illustration here from david goodsell which i love and uh, this is showing uh basically uh neuron synapse right uh but we're looking at these um molecular scale vision of, of uh, synapse and I, I so we are trying to understand the uh, the biological activity that's happening here within our cells in this complex mechanism that can be neuron synapse or many others and this emerges as a result of the combination of different events like happening across uh, several sizes and several different times right uh, like for, for example for the synapse to happen um yeah there there needs to be um uh different cellular processes like uh transport or structural or uh, cellular uh, like cellular signaling and this happens in a different time and size scales like there's uh, small interactions between proteins happening at a very atomic even atomic scale on nanometers and 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 just a few uh uh, nanoseconds and then this cellular transport uh, can happen in the other order of uh, mic microseconds while the whole synapse might just take a millisecond uh, I'm I'm not sure now but what I would just want to display it's all this variety of, of sizes and time scales that um, that basically describe all these um, well that that are integrated in all this multi-scale process that is um, biological activity or molecular molecular biology. So here's an overview of the different uh, time and size scales that we encounter in a, in a cellular system, right? And first of all, we have these um, on the scale of uh, angstroms and nanoseconds. And here we deal mostly with the uh, molecules, small organic molecules or portions of these uh, molecules. And well, here the effects, of these individual atoms, uh, and they're most accurately described using quantum mechanics, right? Um, for example, here we have this uh, isolated amino acid, uh, I think it's, yeah, glycine. And um, yeah, so the, the dynamics and how it uh, 
all the conformations and the energy potential can be understood using quantum quantum mechanics, right? And then on the next scale, uh, we have um, this is a protein. This is a yeah, it is an example protein. I think it's leptin, uh, but essentially this is a, a full protein which is a, a sequence of amino acids, right? It's a polymer of amino acids, and all these uh, these particular all these particular sequences they they um, they fold into a, a certain structure, right? And all the all the time and size scales um, included in here um, to form this structure, they, they usually go from uh, yeah from nanoseconds to microseconds or even milliseconds. And here we're going like one one scale up in the in the in the size scale, and then we can go into several um, um, like molecular assemblies. Of several distinct proteins or biomolecules, and here the dominant time scales are usually associated with uh, molecular binding events, enzymatic activity, and like cellular signaling, and so on, uh, and many, many more, right? And then if we extend even further, then we have like entire cellular mechanisms that entail different um, molecular interactions, and here the um, there's a it's a large space scale and also these processes can go from milliseconds to beyond like seconds and even minutes at, at so on and some points um right and obviously because of this multi-scale um nature of molecular biology we need to approach um our the systems we are studying even if it's uh with different methods even if we're talking about experiments or we're talking about uh computational methods right here is an overview which i took from this great review um uh showing the different uh, methodologies to study different um different time and size scales uh for biological activity right um in for this talk the one that it interests interests us the most is the subcellular scale uh, because we will be mostly looking at proteins, right, which fits in here. And the main method, computational method here to study uh, proteins, it's molecular dynamics, uh, right? So, yeah, molecular dynamics, is, it's, it's, it's a great method because it allows us to simulate an entire system, well, protein system at the, at the atomic detail, right? And... Um, also on the on the time scale, we we go femtosecond by femtosecond. So the time resolution is really high because usually uh, the uh, the normal um, trajectory size of an of an empty trajectory it's, can be in the order of uh, nanoseconds, microseconds, or even milliseconds in some cases, right? So uh, molecular dynamics allows us to integrate a lot of time and size scales all into the same an analysis, right? So that is, it's why it's so powerful and it combines perfectly with other experimental techniques. Um, <clears throat> so how does uh, MD work? Um, well, the basics of, of how MD works, it's very simple actually. So we just have these atomic positions. Uh, so a given PDD structure, for example, and we move them, um, across time using the Newton equations of motion. And that's it. It's a very simple thing, right? Um, I mean, the, the using the Newton's equation motion, motions, it's easy. And the MD algorithms are very uh, optimized in order to do so for several steps, right? So, because every time step that we're uh, moving in here, it's in the order of femtoseconds. Uh, usually it's uh, one, two, uh, or even four femtoseconds that it's used uh, to move our system across time, right? And we use uh, these equations to know the, the next positions. Uh, the tricky part here on MD, well, one of the tricky parts is how we obtain the forces that gets uh, that we use to obtain acceleration and so on. So these forces come um, uh, by integrating the, the, energy, uh, the potential energy of our system, right? And how do we define this energy potential is critical in order for our simulations to be accurate. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, well, uh, we use a molecular mechanics mo uh, mod modeling uh, to model the interactions between uh, our atoms uh, and the ones that define 
the general energy potential of our system. And how molecular mechanics works? Well, this is, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a simplification using classical mechanics uh, where the electrons are neglected and we consider our atoms just uh, by our nuclei. nuclei. And um, yeah, and, and mostly bonds, it's like where the two atoms are bonded with like a, with like a spring. You can, you can see it like that because it's use, it uses uh, Hooke's law to model uh, bonded interactions. We also have more interactions like angles and torsion angles for the bonded interactions. And then we also have uh, non-bonded interactions, which are mainly electrostatics and Leonard Jones potential trying to model Van der Waals and this type, this type of non-bonded uh, interactions. And the sum of all these um, uh, different uh, energy different potential energies um, it's what describes the the full energy potential and basically all these parameters uh, that uh, describe these different uh, interactions it's what we uh, call as a force field and we parameterize this force field uh, based on either quantum mechanics co computations that are more exact um, or even experimental uh, methodologies and well, here's an example of what an MD trajectory looks like. Um, oh, wait, I need to, I cannot uh, go a little bit further. Yeah, so this is what a molecular dynamics trajectory can do. Here it's trying to simulate uh, uh, protein ligand binding where this red ligand will bind here into its pocket, right? And essentially this is, this is done by propagating forward in time this Newton's, using Newton's equation of motion, the atomic coordinates, right? And so this is an example result of what MD looks like. Um, okay, and here I have some sum up of some um, examples of what MD can do uh, in terms of publications, right? So for example, here we have a, an excellent uh, example on protein folding. Uh, which is this great paper by Lindor, uh, Crest and Lindor Larsen, where they simulated uh, long trajectories of uh, these fast folders, and they were able to recover the whole uh, folding process. Uh, we also have example, an example here of um, complete simulation and modeling of a protein-protein association between Barneys and Barstar. Um, then we also have I mean, this is just an example, but there are several protein ligand binding assays. Uh, here is an example with a GPCR, which is a hot topic in drug discovery. Or even here, there's an example of uh, an intrinsically disordered protein uh, binding to a small molecule, uh, which in uh, IDPs uh, particularly, it's, it's one of the only ways to study them computationally because they don't have a stable structure, right? So you need to know the dynamics of your system uh, to understand what's going on, you can not do anything with just the structure, all right? Uh, so there, these are just examples of what you can do with molecular dynamics. Um, particularly here, we're going to focus on protein folding, all right? Protein folding is a, it's a very tricky, uh, it's, it's a very complicated problem, and essentially it's trying to decipher how the sequence, uh, genetic sequence, uh, is then codifies the information for the structure, dynamics, and ultimately the function of every protein, right? And, and um, there has been studies with them, uh, done with uh, molecular dynamics in protein folding, as I showed just before, but still, uh, because protein folding is a very slow process, usually it ranges from milliseconds to seconds uh, or longer, it's very hard to tackle with MD, okay? Uh, there was, there have been uh, recent advances in protein structure prediction, particularly, which is alpha fold. Uh, you might have heard of it, and they they achieved an, an uh, amazing accuracy on structure prediction with their uh, novel neural network model. And um, but, <clears throat> and you might say, oh, okay, but uh, protein folding is solved, right? But uh, it's it's not quite the case. I mean, it's really helpful to have this amazing tool here, but uh, ultimately, uh, if we want to solve protein folding, we need, we need to understand how sequence codifies protein function. The end point is protein function is not structure. And just with the structure of our protein, we're not gonna understand how function works because we need dynamics in it. We need to know the dynamics of this protein because usually 
um, the dynamics of our pro uh, of, of, of the protein it's it's they are critical for protein function. So we need um, other methodologies that are able to give to for uh, that enables us to look into the into this protein dynamics and to understand how uh, structure and 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 the sequence um, then uh, codifies ultimately dynamics and function. Um, so we need something uh, to understand dynamics, but MD it's uh, it's usually hard to to for us to study protein folding with just MD simulation. So what can we do here? Well, there there are um, we need to resource to uh, uh, higher approximations, as we do with as is as it is the example of MD being an approximation of quantum mechanics. We need to go even further, one level above of approximation, and do and perform coarse graining. So essentially, coarse graining is just trying to uh, summarize our system into the most important atoms, or even grouping several atoms into what we will call now beads, which are these balls here which um, yeah, they, they can be used to describe like an entire amino acid, for example. And what, does this, what, what this does is that instead of having to simulate and propagate through time a system with um, like hundreds of thousands of atoms, which uh, this becomes very computationally expensive, uh, we can just simulate a very small system of hundreds or even tens of, 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 of beats, which is very easy to perform, right? Because it's, you reduce a lot the number of computations you have to do, and therefore it's, it's much faster. So we're gonna see how we can tackle protein folding with coarse graining, right? And um, well, here I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna describe like different approaches for coarse graining. Um, like typically we have uh, top-down approaches or bottom-up approaches, which, um, <coughs> sorry, um, yeah, top-down approaches, they just try to uh, to define a coarse grain model based on experimental data or other macroscopic uh, properties, while bottom-up approaches, they try to uh, define this coarse grain model based on more fundam oh, atomistic models, more fundamental descriptions. And yeah, I mean, the, the essence of coarse graining is that it, it, they try to recover a physically plausible uh, force field um, from either yeah, atomistic models or experimental observables, and that is a highly non-trivial task, okay? And traditional methods for coarse graining, they have been suffering from low transferability, limited expressivity, or intuition bias uh, by humans because as, as, as it says here, it, it, it is a highly non-trivial task to perform these things. And so here, um, well, next. So the, uh, the object that it, of central importance in uh, coarse graining is the so-called potential of mean, mean force, uh, essentially uh, for bottom-up uh, approaches, right? Um, so this potential of mean force, it's the, a function um, of the coarse grain ma uh, mapping from the original system to the lower uh, dimensional system. So technically, uh, it is defined as the total Boltzmann weight of the area and phase space of atomistic configurations, right? So this area here, um, that map into a single point, into a single configuration in the coarse grain phase space. Um, so basically, this is like integrating this area here that we have in atomistic space uh, into this single point in the um, coarse graining space and it has this form here and uh, unfortunately recovering this potential of mean force in an analytical ways it's it's basically intractable because this um this expression is it's it's um, yeah this uh, it's 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 a multibody um it's multibody and 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 typically typically very complicated so analytical recovery of the potential of mean force is impossible and we have to resort to numeral, numerical techniques. And here it's where I'm going to show our approach, um, which is basically performing for ma force matching uh, using neural network potentials. Uh, so um, <clears throat> this is our approach of uh, trying to approximate this uh, potential of mean, fo mean force and we do that instead of uh, using um, 
some um, humanly defined way of, of doing that or some intuitive way, we let a neural network learn how to do um, this, uh, this approximation of the potential of mean force. And uh, the approach that we are doing here, um, well, yeah. So instead of uh, imposing a fixed functional form, uh, we use a deep neural network, right? And so how does this work is that the training data is basically the um, atomic coordinates and the atomic forces obtained from uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And essentially these uh, atomic coordinates are featureized um, yeah, they, they are transformed into roto transitionally invariant features. Um, and then they are propagated through the network and they are compared to the real forces. So essentially this force matching means that uh, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're, we're making our network predict forces and we're comparing them to real uh, forces obtained from MD simulations, uh, right? And and this is uh, how the loss function works and we're, we're optimizing that. So we're making our network learn um, to predict forces from uh, atomic coordinates, essentially. And um, so one problem of, of this first application, which is CGNet, comes from this publication. Uh, one problem from, from this application is the featureization here, because uh, in this example, the featureization uh, it's unique to uh, the system that you're training to and is fixed and and thus it means that it, this is not transferable to other systems. So um, creating this potential in particular has no real application. So need, we need some featureization that uh, enables us, uh, that enables this model to be transferable to other protein systems. And this is where graph neural networks come in or, basic, or a particular application for um, at um, molecular modeling, which is uh, the Ginette architecture, right? So essentially Ginette consists of uh, atom embeddings and interaction refinements and atom-wise energy contribution. And um, yeah, so because at each layer, the atomic system is represented atom-wise, um, then this means that, that uh, and also that the atom representation is learned by the network itself, it's performed atom-wise, this means that um, this network uh, is transferable because you can input any system size in, in, in here and it, and it will predict uh, some energies or in our case, it's going to be forces, um, right? Um, something that I forgot to mention here before is that, um, so instead of making the network um predict directly the forces what we do is we make the network predict the energy right and then because the network is inherently be inner inherently differentiable we can obtain the forces by differentiating the, like integrating the energy right and in this way by predicting the energy uh we make uh the uh, our our network um yeah, I, I, um, we make our, our network uh, equivariant network, right? So um, this is important. And uh, then another thing that we need uh, is, um, so when performing this training, um, if you just do it uh, directly into the, into the forces, uh, this neural network potentially is gonna poorly approximate the, the regions where there is no data. So uh, if our training data doesn't visit certain configurations or certain conformations, um, right, or even unphysical conformations that it will not see because MD simulations are not going to sample that, right, um, then the network um, has, a, has a hard time predicting uh, the correct uh, energy and forces in, in, in those conformations. So in order to solve this problem, we're going to use uh, some prior forces. Um, Right, so we're gonna avoid uh, these force priors are gonna um, like intuitively they're gonna add some physical knowledge into the network, well, into our uh, algorithm, right? And they're gonna directly avoid these very like unphysical conformations essentially and the very 
high energetic conformations and yeah we define some very minimal priors um, which are basically bonds between uh, bonded atoms and repulsions okay uh, which define these non-bonded interactions and here it's um, here is a, a general uh, scheme on how this is going to work uh, our coarse grain simulations um, so essentially we first need to obtain a prior force field okay and this prior force field in our case is going to come from a large md simulation data set which is this cat data set that we're going to speak uh, uh, in in some moments and essentially from this data set we extract the bonded distances and the non-bonded non distances and we're going to define these very basic potentials with um, some harmonic potentials that define the bonded interactions and some and some potential de um, derived from some uh, from uh, Leonard Jones that defines the repulsions and this is going to become our prior force field and and then this is introduced in our uh, in our simulation uh, in this way. So essentially, we're going to have the Cartesian coordinates, so the coordinates of our coarse grain system, and we're going to obtain forces from two different sources. So we're going to have the force field, which is going to give our prior forces. And then Schnett is trained to only predict the delta forces, which these delta forces are basically the difference of the full Cartesian forces obtained from MD minus these prior forces that we're computing. And Schnett is only trying to predict delta forces. So it's only trying to predict the difference between the prior and the correct forces and not the overall force, because then this is where it poorly approximates. And um, when we're simulating, uh, we just sum up these prior forces with the delta forces, we obtain the full forces, and we propagate our system. And this is got to, we're going to do this uh, using TorchMD, which is our software to perform um, simulations using neural network potentials. So essentially, what is TorchMD? TorchMD is um, yeah, I'm like uh, an MD engine that is fully written in PyTorch, and that means that it is fully differentiable, right? All the computations are expressed as, as torch arrays, including bonds, angles, dihedrals, and all the type, all types of interactions, and um, yeah, it has been built as an, a standard MD engine, right? But with the addition that um, because it's written in PyTorch, it is very easy, very easy for us to add these external forces, um, which they're mainly meant to be uh, neural network potentials. It can be anything, but uh, they're mainly meant to be neural network potentials. And because these neural network potentials, they are usually written in, like they're done in PyTorch, then it's very easy to integrate them and simulate these learned potentials, right? Um, well, uh, some implementation details on uh, TorchMD. This is an example of the YAML files that we use to define the force fields, so it's very easy. Um, it also supports standard force fields like Amber or Charm, um, Velocity Berlet Integrator, and it also supports multiple replicas of the same system at the same time, and so on. And these are the current, so TorchMD, it's mainly this uh, MD uh, engine, but we also use it to englobe these different applications that we're using it for, that we're using it. So first of all, it's the standard MD simulation engine, uh, which can perform all atom simulations and support standard force, force fields. Then there, there's a specific uh, rep, repo for um, the part that it's, um, aimed at training neural network potentials, which we'll call TorchMDNet. Then because uh, TorchMD, it's, it's built in PyTorch, it's, it's entirely differentiable. So it means you can perform end-to-end -end differentiable simulations. And then it's the example that we will talk about today, which is the uh, this particular application, which is called TorchMD CG, which is the uh, training uh, course rate potentials and then simulating them uh, in particular for protein folding. This I was no here. Um, yeah, so some um, some performance uh, data. This is uh, how it performs uh, with different systems on uh, on. This is just a standard all atom MD simulations. 
um, and the different times. I mean, compared to, uh, for example, ASMD3, which is another uh, MD engine, it's it's very slow because it's not optimized um, uh, to be fast, but basically to prototype and to the, the design um, neural network potentials because currently most MD engines cannot integrate these neural network potentials or if they can do, they're very slow and it is complicated. So it's not very easy to prototype, right? So TorchMD was not defined to be fast uh, um, right now and it misses some uh, optimizations that uh, normally MD engines do and that and that is why um, the, the, the speed differences um, compared to um, uh, typical MDE engines. And here is an example of uh, what I mentioned about end-to-end -end differentials, differentiable simulations, where um, uh, you, you, tra uh, you train uh, a potential uh, essentially while you, you are simulating, right? So here is an example where uh, we trained a, um, a potential starting from zero and it learned to predict the partial charges between these different ions as if as it was simulating itself. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go uh, over uh, TorchMD CG and our cross-grained force field. And in particular, we we are applying this to protein folding, okay? Um, so, um, our, our objective, uh, it's gonna be to uh, create a coarse-grained potential that is able to reproduce uh, protein fold folding as accurately as MD simulations. So for example, for our example here, we're gonna take these 12 fast folders uh, from the Lindorf Larsen paper and we're gonna we're gonna create an uh, we're gonna use the MD simulations uh, of these uh, fast folders to train a course grain potential and then simulate uh, each of these fast folders and see if we're able to reproduce correctly uh, the folding process, right? So these are gonna be our coarse grain strategy. Uh, we're gonna, um, so all the, the the all atom system is gonna be coarse grain into uh, only the carbon alphas of this system. Okay, so from the MD uh, simulations, we're, we're just gonna obtain the, the, um, the carbon alpha, uh, the carbon alpha, uh, atoms and forces, and we're going to use that to define our coarse grain system. Um, here is uh, the training data set that we had to perform this, uh, which um, essentially has several uh, microseconds or even milliseconds on each fast folder, and this is what we're going to use to train our potential. And well, this is some details on how the simulations were performed. They were all performed at the same temperature, 350 Kelvin. Uh, Charm 22 star were, uh, was the four field used for the MD simulations. And we and all the simulations were started from um, unfolded uh, confirmations, which were previously obtained by simulating them at high temperatures. And yeah, we essentially used different adaptive sampling techniques to, to be able to sample the whole uh, folding process and we used GPU grid to uh, perform all these simulations, which is a distributed computing project. And then also to define the, 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 pri the prior force field that is used to make the prior forces, uh, we generated this uh, huge data set, uh, which we call the CATH data set, which basically we simulated uh, very different uh, structural protein domains. Um, 12,000 um, protein domain, different protein domains uh, extracted from different cath um, uh, categories. And for each protein domain, we perform five replicas of 10 nanoseconds at different temperatures. And uh, we currently have like uh, 20 milliseconds of data. And that is what we use to fit, to, to fit the uh, parameters for our prior force field. Uh, and, and well, here's some description on GPU grid, uh, GPU grid, which is this distributed computing project that we used uh, to perform both the fast folder uh, MD simulations and uh, the CAD data set. And yeah, essentially it's, uh, we, we can reach to like almost 5,000 active users uh, with different active hosts. And basically we have um, a huge computational power when using GPU grid and all this thanks to the people that is um, um, donating their computational computational resource and electricity and 
It's something that it's uh, great to have and it's very powerful. So as a summary of everything, um, we have uh, on how the whole process of defining our coarse grain uh, potential and performing simulations works. First, we need to prepare our data. So we need to uh, prepare the prior force field. And so the prior forces uh, parameters, and then we also need to do this, um, this step on extracting the prior forces from the MD forces. So what we will call the Delta forces. And then we train our network using the atomic coordinates of carbon alphas and the corresponding delta forces for these uh, carbon alphas. And once we have our network trained, uh, we're going to perform simulations using using TorchMD and using the coarse grain potential as this external external force. And then we're going to analyze our simulations and see how how well they they are doing and if they're working or not. Um, here I have these. Um, a notebook that I want to show you, um, but I think first I'm going to go over to the results. Um, I'm going to show you the results we have obtained in our lab uh, using this approach for the fast folders. I'm going to go a bit quickly here because I want to show this uh, uh, notebook here, but I think first I'm going to go for the results. So here are our results of, um, of training a coarse grain potential based on MD simulations for these fast folders, and then simulating these, these fast folders. And what you're seeing here is the comparison of uh, the structures we obtained uh, from these coarse grain simulations, which are in orange, and uh, the native structure, which is uh, depicted in, in blue. And as you see here, our coarse grain force field is able to recover uh, the folded structure for all these fast folders. And also here, like in, in, in this blurry uh, orange cloud, you can see several different confirmations sampled from, uh, uh, from, from the macro state defined for, from our MD simulations. So you can see that, uh, that it, 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 you were able to predict correctly this, uh, the metastable state that is the, the folded state. Um, okay. And here are some videos of, of the, um, of the folding process that, that we obtain with these um, coarse grain simulations. Um, here is the very basic one of chignolin. This is really quick because chignolin is only 10 amino acids. Uh, but then we can go to more complicated cases um, like uh, here BBA, which has a small beta sheet region, which I think it only folds at the end. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Wait, I missed it. Yeah, so first for the helix and then it correctly puts the beta sheet together, as in here. Or if we go to even larger cases, uh, which are really nice to see, like for example, these A3D. Where it first uh, forms these uh, alpha helices and then it puts them all together. And this is entirely done by the coarse grain potential. So it's only simulating the carbon alphas um, of the system. And it's able to recover the, the folding process and the native structure. Or same here with protein B, which uh, has a helix. And then this uh, four uh, beta sheet region. And again, it's able to correctly get the folded structure. This, um, and here it's a more in-depth analysis on what's going on in our simulations. So here we have the example of chignolin and we train different, different types of models. So we have protein specific models where the coarse grain potential is only trained uh, using simulations of only chignolin in this case. And then we have the general model, which is trained using uh, data from all the fa uh, fast folder simulation, MD simulations, right? And um, so the protein specific model is obviously more accurate here uh, with chign particularly chignolin, but it's not going to work for other, not, not going to work as well for other proteins because it has only seen chignolin. Uh, but as we can see here, we are able to obtain the, the uh, folded structure. Here is a contact map also showing that it's able to recover all the native contacts. And here, uh, well, the here the, the labels are very uh, small, but here essentially are the uh, 
trajectory RMSD to the native structure. So in blue, we have low RMSDs and in red, we have higher RMSDs compared to the uh, native structure. And uh, what this shows is that the simulations uh, not only recovered the folded state, but they were able to simulate several, several folding and unfolding events. And here is a description of the free energy surface uh, of our system, which is this, uh, defined with uh, the first um, the first main Tika components. Um, and yeah, as we can see, our coarse grain potential is not only able to simulate folding and unfolding events, but it also correctly or well, accurately describes, as it can do for a coarse grain potential, the free energy surface uh, compared to the reference uh, MD simulations. The general model is a little bit worse on that uh, because it has information for for from all the fast folders and usually the unfolded state is not or misfolded states are not uh, as accurately uh, described but still um, it's a it's, it's a fairly accurate representation and another example here with protein g where uh, here what i'm trying to show is that it not only correctly describes the folded state uh, but also the, these different other minimas across the free energy surface, right? So here we have the reference, and here marked are different uh, states of our system, which is protein G. And I'm showing the folded state here, some misfolded states in blue, and some partially folded state in magenta, and also the unfolded state in red. And we sampled confirmations from the same minimas uh, from the coarse grain simulations, and we can see that they're very similar, right? So the folded state, it's, it's recovering the folded state and the misfolded state we can see here um, as the main example on what this misfolding state is about, which is missing this part here. And also the partially folded states, they're very similar and well, the unfolded, it's obviously unfolded. And here are the overall uh, results um, of our, of the work we have performed here on training a coarse grain potential and later simulating for uh, fast folders. And here are some references that you'll be able to um, see. And this is all that we have been working on and describing what we have been doing in more detail. And, and we're now preparing um, a larger uh, publication with all these results that I'm showing here. Uh, so now, uh, I'm going to leave this here that it's going to be able to be seen in the video. And now we're going to go to the uh, practical example of the notebook that is going to show, show you how to, um, how to uh, as an example, on how to coarse grain chignolin, like how to prepare a potential, a coarse grain potential for chignolin and later simulate it, right? Um, yeah, I'm seeing that um, I don't have that much time, so I'm going to go um, a bit quick in here. Um, so yeah, let's go. This is our notebook. Um, also, the, uh, in the previous presentation, I left a, a link there with a GitHub link that uh, points out to this same notebook, so you'll be able to revisit this. Um, it's essentially a tutorial on how to perform these coarse grain potentials and simulations. So first, we're going to import all the necessary packages. Um, and we're going to download already the, the trained potential and the simulation data because this usually takes some days to perform and we don't have that much time now. Uh, okay, so first we're going to go on uh, data preparation. All right, so well, for our system, we're going to need uh, the PDB file and the PSF file that we have here with our data. And we're basically going to filter only the the carbon alphas from these uh, structures. And then we're going to go with the prior force parameters. And in this case, instead of using this uh, CAD data set to extract the parameters, we're only going to use the same simulation data that, that we're using for training uh, of Chignolin to extract the parameters. So these parameters are, are just going to be fitted using Chignolin simulations, right? They're not going to be as accurate, but they're going to do the work. Um, Okay, so first we're gonna load the original data, which, uh, well, the original coordinates, we're gonna just move them. And here we're gonna start, um, uh, we're gonna start our fitting of the uh, priors 
only using these coordinates. We're going to start our priors using the different um, thing that we want to fit. I mean, electrostatics, we're not going to fit electrostatics. We're going to mainly define bonds and um, Leonard Jones. Okay. Um, So first, we're going to go with the bonded interactions, which have, have this form, which is approximated by an harmonic function. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this, is described, this is the fitting range of the, of the distances that we are going to use to fit our priors. And here you can see uh, how well these priors are fitted to the simulation data, which are the blue dots. And here it's just some examples on different interactions between different atom types, so different types of uh, carbon alphas from different residues. And then we're going to go for non-bonded interactions, which uh, they use this uh, custom function uh, inspired by Leonard Jones terms. Um, again, as we did with the bonded parameters, we're going to do with the non-bonded parameters. Here it's a bit the fitting is not as accurate, but it's still going to work. And now we're going to write all these parameters that we have uh, fitted into a YAML file that uh, we're going to use both to prepare the delta forces and uh, to perform simulations with TorchMD. Uh, so now we need to prepare these delta forces that, um, again, I'm going to repeat, these delta forces uh, are the result of getting the original uh, signaling forces, and then subtracting the uh, computed priors for the coordinates. Uh, so we're going to use, so for each frame, we got coordinates, a spe spe specific uh, coordinates for each uh, carbon alpha and the corresponding forces, right? And for each frame, we're going to use these coordinates to compute the prior forces and then subtract these prior forces from the uh, overall forces, which is going to result in these delta forces, right? That these delta forces are the, the ones that are going to be used to train the network uh, because um, of what I explained before, that the network is not able to uh, correctly estimate um, these non-physical areas, right? So again, we're going to load all our, our data, and we have this function uh, that we have in TorchMD CG that is going to compute directly the delta forces. Uh, this takes some time. Uh, obviously, I've reduced uh, considerably the data set of uh, MD's uh, signaling simulations that we are going to prepare, because if not, it's going to take a long time. Um, and then, then we're going to prepare our embeddings uh, for um, um, the network, which is based on, based on Chinet. So to prepare the embeddings, what we're going to do is define um, for each type of, uh, for each atom type, which is essentially for each uh, different type of residue, we're going to define a different uh, uh, integer. And this already will work for uh, the Schnet um, network. And then for training, here is an example of the train YAML file that we would use to train uh, the network. Um, well, there are different uh, hyperparameters defined here. Um, you can um, take a look at them more uh, particularly if you want to know uh, specifically. It's it's all described in here. I'm just gonna go uh, quickly over here. Uh, and yeah, here I mean we already downloaded the pre-trained pre uh, like training results, and you can we can see here how the results look like for this type of training. And yeah, essentially. This is the last function across different epochs, and we're gonna pick this. Uh, we're gonna pick this model to perform the simulations. Uh, we're not picking the latest model because this is probably overfitted, as you can see with the train loss that it still goes down, while the validation loss it's still on the same level. So more or less, when the curve it start it starts to um, to be stable, we pick a model here, and this model is the one that we're gonna use to perform the simulation. So. Essentially, it's going to be our coarse grain potential, right? And then simulations. So in here, we're going to take back these uh, priors that we defined before, and we're going to use the, um, the the network that we trained. So we so we're going to select the the specific epoch that we defined here, which is going to be epoch 80, 
And here is how a uh, simulate um, YAML file looks like um, on performing uh, simulations with TorchMD, right? So we, you define different, different parameters for our simulation, like the force field of priors that we're gonna use, the initial coordinates and topology file of your system, um, some technical details, uh, you have to define your, your CUDA device, uh, the number of rep replicas you wanna perform, uh, you have to define the embeddings. Uh, so each number here is different type of amino acid that Chignoling has. And well, here it's the external calculator here. So here is where you define uh, this external potential, which is basically our neural network potential that we trained before. So in this part is where you define um, the network details. So you have to define the embeddings that um, you're gonna use to predict the forces. And then some simulation details like Langevin temperature, um, the time step of your simulations. I mean, the, this time step is not a specific; it's not in a specific time units, um, but uh, because our cross grain potential doesn't um, doesn't. I mean, I mean, the cross grain potential gives forces without time units. Um, so yeah, we can use this uh, simple command to run our TorchMD simulation. And yeah, you have more details here on um, on the on the different parameters. So now that we have simulated all this and everything is completed, we're gonna go over the analysis of this data and we're gonna see how well it has performed. So this code it just analyzes the the outputs uh, stored in NPY files and the trajectories and. We're gonna look at the energies and the RMSDs uh, compared to the um, to the native structure to see if we are able to uh, simulate several folding and unfolding events and if it's able to recover the folded state. And here are our results. Um, on the left, we have the different types of energy in our simulation. So the kinetical energy, the potential energy, and the total energy uh, defined in green. And then we have here the RMSD. Um, uh, here uh, we are showing both the RMSD to the native structure compared to the native structure, which is this blue uh, side here, but also to the mirror structure because um, our uh, prior uh, forces only include bonded and non-bonded interactions, and the bonds are just uh, they don't include angles or torsions. So um, this means that um, our system can go into mirror images uh, of the native structure because there are no angles or torsion information. So we're also adding this here in our RMSD plots because if we're reaching the mirrored uh, folded state, um, we're also reaching the folded state essentially. And as we can see here for the, the stand trajectories, we're able to recover um, the folded state and we're able to sample several unfolded to folded transitions and vice versa. So um, here's the, uh, the end of, our, of this notebook. Uh, again, you can visit this notebook here in this link uh, on GitHub. And, and that is uh, all for this e-seminar. So now it's uh, time for questions. Um, you can ask any question. I will try to answer these questions on the little time we have now. And if not, you can contact me and send me further information, further questions that you have of this system. And also remember that you have all these references here that you can uh, visit in order to learn uh, in much more detail how all these course green for uh, potential works and also on how Torch and the capabilities of Torch and D. So now I think um, it's your turn, uh, Tim. So uh, thank you very much, Adria. Thank you. Um, just a quick, uh, just a quick reminder for the audience: if you have any questions, then please go ahead and write them in the questions tab um, so that I can read them out for you. And so now, whilst we wait for those questions to start coming in, I actually have a couple myself for you, Adria. Yeah, um, sure. So my first question is on the amount of training data used in obtaining your coarse-grained models. So, for example, we've seen with AlphaFold that their system was trained on something like 170,000 protein structures. So you mentioned the CAF dataset containing about 12,000 protein domains, if I recall correctly. 
Um, does all of that data go into the model or is it just some carefully selected subset that is sufficient to obtain good potentials? Okay, so, so yeah, um, I mean, the, this uh, force matching approach is a very data hungry uh, approach, all right? And um, so there's, I think, yeah, there, you have a confusion there because uh, the CAD data set, we used, we used it only to fit the priors. Uh, I mean, we have tried uh, in our lab to train a model using all these uh, simulations from the CAD data set, but uh, we still need to optimize our code and our training because it's really slow and we need to um, optimize the hyper hyperparameters and it's a lot of work. So we're currently not focused on that. It's probably going to be uh, in, the, in the future work. Uh, so here the CAP data set is only used to fit the priors. Uh, and the data that we use to train the network, it's only from the, it's only simulations from the fast folders. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, this is the data that we use uh, to train our coarse grain potential, which is a lot of simulation data and it's not available to most of the uh, labs. This is all thanks to GPU, sorry, to GPU grid. And um, yeah, so uh, one drawback of this method uh, currently now is that it's very data hungry. So you need extensive simulations. Uh, but ideally, uh, and this is something that we want to try with the CAD data set, uh, is that you'll be able to define this general potential that is going to be transferable to other systems and uh, especially systems that are not, have not been seen by the network, uh, right? So at some point, it, this is just, um, like computing all this expensive data only one time um, to then generate this potential that is going to be transferable to all uh, the possible protein domains. And that is the ideal scenario, right? Uh, but for now, it is just what it is. Um, I mean, we're also working on on studying on the transferability of our system. Uh, we have done some work, uh, but yeah, well, essentially summing up, uh yeah this method is very data hungry i see i see thanks for that yeah i think there was a slight misunderstanding on my side um, to start with so following on from that i suppose this is more of a question of machine learning in general but how do you avoid overfitting your model i mean i think this was briefly touched upon in your demonstration um where there was this plot that informed which epoch to select um in an attempt to avoid this uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so one thing is just uh, correctly selecting your uh, your model, and um, because they tend to overfit if you let them for too many epochs. But also, uh, well, we have been doing several hyperparameter optimization and some uh, adaptations to the uh, uh, neural network architecture to avoid uh, overfitting. And also, well. Uh, also, what I have to say is that this model currently, it's kind of overfitting only to the fast folders because the best way to avoid overfitting to the training data is to have an extensive data set with different types of structures and protein systems. And as for now, it only uh, has 12 different systems, right? So it's, it's going to overfit into those systems if you compare it to the entire protein structure data set, right? uh but uh yeah uh, in a more practical way like um the most uh, yeah the main thing that we did to avoid overfitting is to select these um early epochs uh and comparing with the test loss and the training loss and so on i see i see thank you um, now I'm seeing a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so first of all, Brian Medell asks, um, so he says it's a very nice talk and some amazing work. Um, he's wondering if you could use TorchMD to study membrane proteins. And so if so, do you think that we could estimate the association dissociation kinetics for protein dimers using this trained uh, CG model? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, we have we have done this uh, for protein folding because we already had this uh, extensive AMD MD simulation data set. Um, but it's just a matter of obtaining the uh, the the adequate uh, training data with MD simulations and performing your and then training these coarse grain potentials and it could have applications on. I mean, I, I already know of some um, collaborators from this project that are applying it to different uh, 
to different scenarios, right? And it, one of them, it could be uh, to train this coarse grain potential uh, for uh, membranes and lipids, but that that is more accurate than uh, what we have now. Uh, yeah, sure, definitely. Oh, brilliant. That's good to hear. And so um, Maxime Vazo asks, um, well, thanks for this great presentation. Um, so for the last example of CG simulations of chignolin, um, what was the training dose you used? Was it based on MD simulations of chignolin itself um, or on the other proteins that you showed earlier in the presentation? Uh, yeah, so on the example, I'm, I'm, I don't know if he's referring to the uh, notebook example that I showed or on this uh, results, right? So, well, for the notebook example, it's just uh, we're just using uh, the training data is uh, MD simulations of chignolin. Uh, so, well, it's it's shown in the in the previous slide. So it's uh, 187 microseconds of uh, folding and unfolding simulations of chignolin, and um, that's what we use in the notebook. Uh, okay, and in this case here, we have two different models. Uh, okay, so we have the protein specific model, which is only trained with um, chignolin simulations, chignolin MD simulations, and then we have the general model which is trained using uh, all the simulations uh, from the fast folders. So not only including chignolin, but also GRPKH, protein G, uh, BBA, bilin, and all the fast folders. Uh, yeah, so these are the different uh, uh, training, uh, training data that we used. Right, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'm seeing a question here from Koyan Vu, and apologies to everyone who's asked questions if I've uh, pronounced anyone's names incorrectly. Um, but can TorchMD be used to study IDPs? Um, I mean, ideally, yes. But but uh, so uh, the problem of IDPs is that um, essentially you're going to be interested in 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 their dynamics, right? And mostly on kinetics and so on. Uh, so, well, I mean, you could, if you have the appropriate data set, uh, training data set, uh, you could be able to get a coarse grain potential that it's uh, able to recover like a free energy surface and maybe recover different um, uh, metastable states that the IDP is on. And uh, yeah, it could be done, but uh, that's going to be difficult, uh, I think. But yeah, definitely it could be done. Right, I see, thanks. I mean, just some puntualization. Like the main difficulty, I think, uh, it's gonna be to obtain the correct uh, training data for it. Uh, I think that's that's the, that's what's gonna be more, more complicated to uh, exactly know uh, or prepare uh, what you're gonna need in order for you to, to train um, uh, an accurate enough potential. But ideally, yes, it could be done. I mean, sure. ideally, it could be done for, uh, like, ideally, this could be become a general coarse-grained uh, model for proteins, right? So it, it should also include um, IDPs. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here from Jose Carlos Gomez de Mayo. Um, first of all, do you think it's possible to get similar performance with open force fields? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring with uh, open force fields. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing the question here in the chat. I don't know if he can clarify a little bit uh, what uh, with open force field does it does he mean? And uh, well, I'll ask you the second question um, anyway. And if, if you'd yeah, be able to clarify yeah. on that question, Jose, that would be brilliant. Um, but did you have the opportunity to analyze important events uh, slash features from the network critical to reach the folded states? Um, so we, I, I think with this question, you mean on the network itself, so trying to understand how the network uh, is learning everything, right? Um, we haven't done much work there. Uh, we just uh, have uh, made some quick analysis on the embedding space. And see if they're like the network is correctly differentiating the different uh, residue types, like for example, grouping together uh, like um, aromatic uh, aromatic residues or positive, uh, positively or negatively charged residues. But we haven't uh, seen anything that makes sense 
um, so far. So, I mean, there is a lot of work to do there, but we haven't done much in that sense. So, sadly, no, we have um, we haven't uh, have the opportunity to to identify these important features. Uh, okay, I think. Well, yeah. Sure. Let's see. Um, so Maxime Vasso actually has a follow-up question for you. Um, so she says, says, thank you for your initial reply. Um, and so if you have time for a second one here, uh, mm -hmm. they're curious yeah. to know what would be the efficiency of the torch MD force field if MD trajectory of Chignolin was not included in the training data set? Okay. Um, we have, I think we have tried that. Um, and um, well, I don't, I'm not sure if we particularly have tried that. So omitting only chignolin and using all the other uh, proteins, right? Um, but um, if I remember correctly, the thing, the times we tried that, it didn't work quite well. And the main answer that uh, that we that we uh, thought at that time is that essentially. Our training data set is not very extensive on systems, uh, right? It, it's only 12 different, different systems. So um, it's not gonna be able to generalize a lot, especially into unseen systems. So in this case, if we train with all the proteins, um, but not Chignolin, and Ch Chignolin is gonna be a totally unseen system, right? Uh, what we are doing now, uh, that it's gonna go into this publication that we're preparing is, uh, we're trying to uh, simulate um, some mutant uh, sequences. So picking some of, um, picking some of these fast folders and and looking for mutants that are in the PDB, like some single single amino acid mutations. And we're trying to see if the coarse grain potential is able to correctly um, predict the the folded structure of that uh, mutant sequence. And that is something that we're working right now. And we're having some results, so you'll be able to see it. I hope uh, soon enough. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to see. I'm going to personally be keeping an eye out for that publication. Mm -hmm. um, Jose has just clarified what um, he meant by open force field, and um, he he says that what he meant was using a different force field from Charm. Okay. Um, well, I mean. You can get a similar performance uh, if you're if the force field you used for uh, the MD simulations is accurate enough. Uh, in the end, I mean, we used Charm 22 star uh, because we thought it was the best uh, in this case to simulate protein folding because also because it's the same that uh, Crest and Lindorf Lars Larsen used uh, at um, at their paper at their fast folding paper so we wanted to get a similar as to their as as to them as we could but yeah definitely you could use other other force fields and simulate your um and the your md simulations and get uh a similar performance um yeah sure right i see um, I'll ask one more question of my own, um, just to give people some time for any last minute questions before I end the session. Um, but as it stands, TorchMD is significant, uh, significantly slower than, say, Acelera's ACEMD, right? Um, so what are the main benefits to using TorchMD compared to such alternatives? And is there anything that can be done to improve this performance? And um, so, you know, what are the main bottlenecks currently in effect? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we, if we're comparing, for example, with ACEMD, I mean, TorchMD, it's mainly done, it's, we were we mainly did TorchMD for ourselves at first. Uh, so we were able to simulate uh, accurately our coarse grain potentials, right? And, and ultimately evaluate our potentials because uh, just by looking at the uh, test loss, it's not enough in this case. So you actually need to simulate your system to know what is happening and to know if it's accurate or not. And at uh, first we were doing, well, if you check the previous references, uh, you'll see that the simulations we performed there were over dam dynamics and more simply, um, like a more simple, um, more simple simulations, uh, but we wanted uh, more accurate simulations. So as similar as SMD as possible. So we made TorchMD as a way to uh, quickly make an MD engine that is able to integrate neural network potential. So the main benefit of using TorchMD is that you're able to simulate uh, neural network potentials with it. 
uh, and uh, that you can iterate fast between training and simulating using TorchMD, right? But if you're, but if you want to go into production mode and just uh, actually simulate a lot of data and so on, you're gonna go to ASMD because it's going it's gonna be fast. Like TorchMD, like the main bottleneck that TorchMD has is that it doesn't have a neighbor list, I believe, uh, which is some algorithmic. Um, advantage that speeds up a lot the computation. And TorchMD currently has not that implemented because uh, it's implemented everything in, in PyTorch. So, so uh, yeah, um, we didn't do that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and ASMD is mainly to, if you wanna perform MD simulations like uh, and production and you wanna simulate longer times, but the main advantage of uh, TorchMD is just that you're able to simulate these neural network potentials. I think that OpenMM is, is working now, or even they already have a way to include these neural network potentials, but I don't know how good it is or if it has some problems. And I think they are actively working now, or even I, I know ASMD is working now to, um, to release a new version uh, where they, um, where they integrate neural network potentials uh, fast, uh, like in a fast way. And in that case, ASMD is gonna be like the, the option to perform these simulations. But for now, the main advantage of TorchMD is that it's the only way to quickly uh, test and use your uh, neural network potentials. Mm, understood, thank you. Um, well, look, there, I mean, there don't seem to be any further questions coming in. Um, so uh, I think this would probably be a good point to draw the session to a close. So thank you once again, Adria, for giving us your time today to speak about machine learning approaches to coarse grain models and Torch MD. Um, and also thank you for giving such comprehensive answers to all of those questions. Uh, well, so thanks. just one final reminder um, that this e-seminar will be available on the Comp Biomed um, YouTube channel and website. Um, so um, Adria, if you just go onto the next slide, I think the, the link should be um, accessible via that, uh, that slide there, yes. I can see it. So yeah, thank you to everyone um, in the audience for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thank you all for attending and to listening to me and for these uh, great questions.